Our aim was to create a plant with a scent that makes its owner happy. We are entering a new era here. The first mood-lifting, antidepressant, happy plant. We've received orders from all over the world. I just wanted to say that I feel really proud to be working with you. Look what I have for you. What do you say we call him Little Joe? You have to take good care of it. Keep it warm. Talk to it. It needs attention. What's so special about it? It makes you happy. <laughs> Haven't you noticed how Chris has changed? I think little Joe's pollen has triggered something. Little Joe changes the people he infects. <laughs> You're starting to notice too, aren't you? Fear can distort our perception of reality. If I make a mistake, then it's my fault. It seems that this has all been a bit much for you. He frightens me. You're a good mother, but which of your children will you choose? Good night, little Joe. Hello, and welcome to Curzon Living Room, an ongoing season of live Q and events on Curzon Home Cinema. My name's Hannah Patterson, and today I'll be talking about Little Joe with director Jessica Hausner and stars of the film Emily Beecham and Kerry Fox. If you're watching us live, we're taking your comments via the comments on YouTube, Twitter and Facebook. The Twitter handle is at Curzon Cinemas, and please use hashtag Curzon Living Room and we'll read out as many as we can. So, hello everybody. Hello. Hello. <laughs> How are you? How are you all? Where are you all? Jessica, at home. Jess at home. I'm guessing home. In the, home, London. I'm in Vienna yes. in, my, in my office. And you're in Vienna. Excellent. <laughs> Jessica, let, let's start with you because I have to say it was quite bizarre re watching this film. I watched it for the second time a couple of days ago. Um, and yeah. how, how the world has changed since I first watched the film and all the all, looking at everybody wearing all the masks and um, all the talk of viruses, which I assume was obviously not your intention when you first started working on it. Um, so could you sort of talk a little bit about the genesis of the film and when you first had the idea for it, please? Yes, um, so uh, the good thing about it is, it is that I have a lot of face masks at home now. <laughs> so I'm well equipped and um, yeah, everyone else was run out of masks. I have them. <laughs> Very good, good to know. Yes, um, so the genesis of this project, um, I think the first idea came uh, from Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Um, I very much like those films. There have been several remakes. And I was very much impressed always by the philosophical aspect of this sci-fi story. Because it's basically about that you don't know who the other people really are, even though you think you might know them and maybe you're wrong. And this is something I think is a very basic human experience that every one of us knows and experiences every day. You're surprised that you think, you suddenly understand that the ones you are close to, who you think you know, your friends, your family, at some point become strangers or do things that you have not at all expected. And this is the, the basic initial moment of, of writing this story. So you were sort of looking at this bigger kind of existential idea about, I guess, notions of authenticity and, and truth, because that's interesting, actually, because the character of Carl makes that comment towards the end of the film about who can really sort of prove the authenticity of feelings. And yes. he sort of follows it up with and kind of who, who cares. So was that the, it sounds like you were coming up with that idea before you were then thinking about the genre, or would you say that the kind of the genre ideas were there with you 
because no. of invasion of the body snatchers as well? Um, I mostly when I start to think about a new film, it's a very specific idea. So I think the initial moment was really the genre and and this um, invasion idea, something invaded the human body and, and changed the people. But um, I think the the original um, aspect of it is not that, but is it is in reality that maybe no one has been infected at all. The, the funny thing about the film is that it's a mind game. You don't know the difference. That is, I think, the terrible thing about trying to be close to someone. It is a sort of illusion. It is more in your head than in the reality between you and the other person. And so is that something that you really wanted to create, this idea that it could, there isn't a definitive answer? Could you the film? There isn't a definitive answer. It's very much for the audience to work out what they think they've just seen. Yes, this is the hardest thing, I think, for us to accept that we don't know. <laughs> and this is what the film is trying to do. Um, Emily, maybe I'll bring you in at this stage. Mm -hmm. If you could talk about your first experiences, sort of reading the script and talking to Jessica and, and talking through those ideas. Well, we discussed a lot of ideas uh, when we met for the first time. Uh, we talked about a lot of the themes like a working woman's life and um, also the uh, conflict with uh, her having a child and the guilt and, that she may have about feeling like she's perhaps not being the perfect mother or, and, but also her passion for her work. And yes, so that was an interesting uh, theme. And what else did we talk about, Jessica, in our first meeting? Well, I think we talked about a little bit about Emmanuel Charpentier. We watched some of her um, interviews and she's a French scientist who, um, uh, discovered this gene editing tool. She created this gene editing tool called CRISPR-Cas9. She was in fact actually um, told to leave her lab because they thought what she was trying to do was not achievable. And anyway, she ended up uh, making one of the most important uh, scientific gene editing discoveries. And, and she's very, um, so she, she's very strong minded, but she's also quite physically little and wears yeah. little scarves. Uh, she's also quite shy, quite small and quirky, but also um, a little bit bristly and a little bit of vulnerability. So there were loads of interesting things that we chatted about. Um, also, Je uh, Jessica showed me a lot of the um, designs and they were really incredible. I thought all the themes together with the, the whole aesthetics was very exciting prospect of working with her. And yeah, let's talk a little bit more about that aesthetic. Maybe, um, first of all, Jessica, you could just talk about your, because you have a very, very controlled style, which you have throughout all your work. Um, and I know that you're very in, I mean, it sounds like an obvious thing to say, you're very in control of your camera, but for you, it's very important. You really sort of storyboard and work those things through before you get to the set. So there isn't improvisation on the set as such, or, it, you know, the characters, sort of the, the actors and characters know where, how they're going to be placed before the scene is shot. Um, could you talk a bit about that process and how that kind of affects how you work with actors? Well, um, <clears throat> it's unusual for me to talk about this with two actresses present, <laughs> so I cannot talk badly about you behind your backs. <laughs> Get I would never do that. <laughs> I would never do that. <laughs> no, I would say it's um, it's a very interesting thing. I think every actor or actress reacts differently to to this um, style of shooting, and I sometimes try to talk about it in advance. For example, I, I talked to Ben Wishow, I remember about this. I told him exactly that I, I can be very annoying and, and <laughs> also boring because it's repetition <laughs> after repetition. He said he would be fine with that. With you, Carrie, I remember that you, I think I got on your nerves quite a lot in the beginning. But then I remember we also, we had a conversation after a while where we talked a little bit more about the style of the film and the whole, like the whole atmosphere that is going to be created. 
and from then on i had the feeling we 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 pull on the same string in a way and and with emily i think oh, no. knew it was different again because emily <laughs> had a great uh like how do you say that if you close your ears <laughs> i i talked and talked and talked and and emily i think you never really listened <laughs> what no. i said and finally the thing is i, I did i think thing, it was just information the good thing about it is it, it was i think that you um you, that you could stay within your own world and i think that's The, that's the most important thing however strict my instructions are and I have a, however well prepared I am I depend on the revolutionary mind of the actors and actresses they have to survive me only then it is interesting if my directing becomes too strict and suffocating it's boring so that's why I need very strong personalities <laughs> Kerry, so, 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 <laughs> tell us, Jessica tell us me, your response. When, when we're in filming, there's a couple of points in that that are quite funny. Because uh, she went and said to me, oh, I think sometimes people just find, you know, they find it very difficult to be natural after everything that I've made them do. And I'm going, <laughs> yeah, right, no wonder. <laughs> and also on the last day of filming, you know, Ben was so wonderful. And we did, you know, we worked well together, I think all of us. But man, you know, we were doing one shot on the last, like we must have done it 60 times. And even Ben Wishaw, who's the most gentle, most warm, most easygoing, most fine, not, you know, worried about these things. He grabbed me by my chest and said, well, he's going to finish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's, a, it's a very different version of, working but I think Jessica's right I mean all actors work in different ways and she just has to tap into it but actually yeah. it's interesting because it has an incredibly cohesive sense of style which is you which you probably unless Jessica you were working like that with different kinds of actors who have their own kind of style you wouldn't be able to get that sense because I know for you you've talked about the fact that you don't want it to you want it to feel artificial to some sense to the you want to point out the artifice of, yes. of the piece of work. You don't want a, a, a piece of naturalism for the audience to respond no, to. No, but it, it has way. to be alive. If, if it's, uh, I used my first films, I worked with non-professional actors and, uh, and, and that was even like here, the contradiction was even stronger because we had a very styled frame, but within that stylish set, there were the non-professional actors who they their acting was yeah how do you say that not so precise or sharp it was more like whatever happened in that moment and that made a very interesting tension i think it created a strange tension and since then i i like this contradiction that on the one hand it's all very organized and styled And on the other hand, as I said before, for example, when I told Emily five times that when she goes in front to the car, she has to turn right. And Emily went up to that point and then she stayed there. And then, okay, sorry, sorry, we have to do it again. You go up to that point and then you turn right and Emily went there. It wasn't five times left. to clarify. It was like probably once. We did yes, think about but I, at that time, I knew you... A little bit and so I was not frustrated maybe a little bit but um, I was actually happy because I had this makes me question myself I have to understand maybe it's for a reason or maybe not and maybe something completely different comes out of it but the important thing is that the actor or actress stays alive that something is still there that that surprises me and this is the interesting work for me well I think it's absolutely there because what's fascinating about it and makes it feel so alive is that it feels like the characters are working on two planes all the time that the project their project public projection to each other and what they're thinking 
that's going on beneath the surface. So you're absolutely getting that kind of live contradiction. Yeah. Um, Kerry, if you could talk a little bit about how you found that, because you're actually probably in a way the most sort of the person with the most movement in the film, in a way, partly because partly because of your relationship with your dog initially, who obviously mm -hmm. sort of moves around a lot more than the other characters who are quite sort of set in their ways. Um, and because you're this sort of truth teller, so we very much get this feeling that you're, you sort of have, as, as the truth is occurring to you more and more, you're kind of getting more agitated about that. Could you just talk a bit about your sort of, your experience of that? Well, I never felt entirely sure on which side of the corner, coin I was playing it. Like I didn't, I wasn't ever, on, I, did, I wasn't 100% sure whether I was the truth teller. Yeah. Or I was playing someone who was totally delusional. Okay. So I, I, I could see both sides always. So I can't, I can't say that I was playing someone who's fixated with their own certainty. Um, yeah, I didn't, I, I didn't know. I didn't know which way it was supposed to end up. You know. Mm -hmm. well, I try not to think about it too much. And was that the same for you, Emily? Do you did you sort of make a decision for yourself about your? I mean, because you you have a a longer arc in terms of mm -hmm. your coming to sort of a realization, which you've been trying to deny for most of the mm -hmm. film, um, regardless of whether it really is the truth or not in your own head. Um, so was that something that you did you did you sort of fix a point at which you were like, right, I, I am changing my mind now. Or did you always have the same thoughts in your head? Uh, it was always very complicated, the, the journey. So it was always changing. Um, yeah. And, and as we were saying, I think the character's always aware of, is always reading things in the other characters and figuring things out. And everything she does is a decision which I guess reflects on what Jessica was just talking about in terms of choreography and all this stuff. It's quite complicated. So, um, yeah, there was decisions, but it, but it was always an ongoing discourse, to be honest. So we were discussing it on the set because yeah. Jessica had very specific ideas about what she wanted. And it sounds like from what you said, it, it, you did a lot of research for the role. Uh, did a, a fair bit. We did go to a lab and we learned about genetic engineering, but that was incredibly complicated. <laughs> and we extracted DNA from a leaf and uh, Ben and I did, and, and we still weren't actually sure what on earth we'd actually done. But there's lots of blue light and comparing charts and we're like, well, I have no idea what we've done. <laughs> but it was Can very interesting say something too, Just with what we were talking about before, like, like you're asking a question of us as if we create our character, but that's actually really not what we do. We, we're just giving options. Mm -hmm. So even though, you know, even if, so Jessica will do 25 takes or something. And still my my objective is to make sure that every take is different but true so ultimately she can choose out of all of them and so i don't have ultimate decision making about what my character will be that's not my job i'm just there to deliver options you know and, and then i lay that trust in, in jessica you know mm -hmm. it's like it's it's yeah I think especially like we create for this... character, but we're not like we're not in control of it. Especially for this story, it was um, it was uh, also for me very much about having those different options because during the shooting, um, I was like I knew the whole story was going to be balanced in the end. When it's when the editing is finished, there will be a balance between this is true or the contrary is true. And we have to sort of go between the two or three possible options. And during the shooting, I wanted to make sure that I have some choices during the editing. So what Carrie said, 
is is especially for your character carrie was i remember the question how crazy should we think bella is or how reliable should we think her what she's saying is and it was a balancing between the two and in the editing i was able to say okay no more a little bit more of this or of that because i wanted to to keep that balance and to keep the audience questioning themselves is she the crazy one or is she telling the truth and that was the same also with with men, ben, ben's character he was also between this maybe he's right and it is completely irrational to think of a virus or is he hiding something and and um, and emily's character i think was went back and forth between the different oh, now I believe this, or do I believe the opposite? That's also why in our conversations, it was sometimes quite <laughs> confusing, yeah. Mm, I, can, I can see that. And it's great because again, you were saying about um, Ben's character because we, you know, for a lot of the film, we don't know whether we can trust him yeah. or not and what his motives are. Very, very hard yeah. to know what his motives are. Um, yeah, and that was fun to do because normally in a film at a certain point, you know who to trust. And in this film, I think you, in the end, you even want to trust Carl suddenly because he's quite, actually quite reasonable, no? I'm not sure if I want to trust any of them, but yes. <laughs> um, uh, and could you just talk a little bit more about genre then? Because I would imagine that that was, you know, like you were saying, which was your point, Care about you weren't, the, the choices, you needed to create loads of different choices for Jessica to have it in the edit, basically. But in a very narrow band. Yeah. Um, and and because it's, you you play Jessica such a sort of fine line with it, with your genre. It's art house, it's sci-fi, it's got thriller elements, it's got fairy tale elements. There's so many different things in the mix. That to kind of find that tone, which presumably you were doing mostly in the edit at that point, making decisions. Did, did it change a lot in the edit? Did you have to keep re-editing it? Mm, I think the, I'm, um, the tone to find the right tone is really the most important thing. But I think it happens already when I write the script. I think this is the time it, I take when I write the script to really find out where is the humor on which line do i walk and what is serious and what is fun and what is the ambivalence i need to find that tone and this for example with writing little joe took quite a while because it you can also make a very serious genetic sci-fi thriller out of the same story if you want and i was always thinking of how can i um, corrupt the story how can I find the the dry humor in it and in all my stories I need that sort of twinkling eye because <laughs> uh, it's also a question of attitude towards life I think this is how I see us <laughs> I have to smile a little bit about how serious everyone takes himself or herself and in the end we all just die I mean if I think of that, um, I find the tone to write my story. Yeah, well, that absolutely comes across because it's it's sense of well, it's very wry, very witty, and very um, very British in lots of ways. I mean, actually, it's your first English language film, which is interesting. Yeah. Why you chose to make this in English language uh, when you haven't with your other films? Um, I have. I like to experiment for the one thing. I have done one film in French language. The film was called Lourdes. Um, and it took place in the south of France, in a, in a French pilgrimage place. And Amofu was placed in Germany, in German language. And I thought it could be a good match to have for a genre film, a sci-fi film, to shoot it in English language. So Invasion of the Body Snatchers, the original novel is written in English it's not a necessity but I thought it's it could go well and it would widen my horizon and maybe something interesting comes out of it I'm going to go to one of the questions um, that we have from the audience now uh, Simon from London um, I'm the son of a single mum and I loved the parallel between Alice and her son each wanting independence it really made me think 
Jessica, can you tell us about why you chose a single mum as the heroine? Um, the, I think the, the struggle uh, of the main character, Alice, between the love for her work and the love for her child. This, this is in the center of the story. Um, she's a sort of Frankenstein character. She's mm. a scientist who creates a monster, but she creates actually two monsters. One is the plant and the other one is her child. Every mother who gives birth to a child creates a sort of monster. I was intrigued by that analogy because I think um, also a child you're, is, is, is a human being you're attached to and still you cannot at all control what the child will do or what, what will become of him or her. And I think it's a very similar thing if you create something as a scientist or as a filmmaker or what, whatever you create, suddenly it gets out of your control. And for scientists, I think this is a very um, important thing to know that no matter what you create, it might not be what you intended it to be. No one can be 100% sure about what is going to happen with an invention. Mm. So this, this strange position of Alice between her work and her child was very important to me also because I think this is a very modern uh, topic. It's, it's what we live with every day. We, we, all women or most of the women now have a career, which is good but they still have to take care of their children. Who thought of that? I mean, <laughs> how can you do all? How can you do both? And I don't have the answer, but at least I wanted to show exactly this, um, this sort of life. Very contemporary theme. Um, Emily, was it, uh, this is from this part of the same question, um, was this an aspect of the role that uh, was a draw for you? Well, I don't have any experience as a mother, because I'm not a mother, but um, we did what I did relate to in terms of what we discussed was um, her relation to work and also thinking forward to if, if you had a child, how on earth do you judge, uh, juggle something that is also not only very demanding, but you're also very passionate about. So um, yeah, that's a very real dilemma for a lot of people. Yeah, it's, very, it's an interesting topic. Was it something that you, I mean, Kerry, was that something that was, was it something that was generally discussed a lot on set or during sort of prep for the film? This is a bigger theme because it feels like everybody sort of has a relationship to it in the film in some way. You with your dog um, in some ways, which I know yeah. sounds like, a, but very much you, you talk about the, about Bello being the most important thing in your life. And well, the Bello I've, has, I've got Bello a dog because of that film, yeah. I now have a dog. <laughs> it changed my life. Um, I never <laughs> thought that I'd have a dog, but now I do. I love it. Um, I well, I don't know. Jessica and I spoke a lot about being working mothers. It's hell, really difficult, and there's so many conflicts and, and dilemmas, and you can't quantify it. Really, it's consistent. I don't, you can't even use all these cliched words like the juggle or the guilt mm -hmm. or the, the, it's just also every situation you find yourself in is so specific and different and you don't know how you're going to respond and you don't know. And, and like when you were just talking, Jessica, about, you know, creating a monster, you know, that's what your children, you know, I, I, I've been in a situation where one of my kids has been sick for many years and that is, that's, being the monster that I've created, you know, it's like, and I'm responsible for it. It's just sort of an, an insanity, which I suppose is, you know, that's also the character I was playing, a sort of a, someone in insanity mm. because they're, the situation is so mad, you know, is what has been created? Is it a monster? Is it a great thing? Is it, and I think it's that it, it's that par paranoia, I guess, is in a way that kind of infuses the whole film, which is brilliant. Um, 
the, there's a question that's come in, which um, it sort of relates to this, which, which is about uh, colour. Um, Jessica, if you could sort of talk a bit about your, the colour in your work and the kind of conversations you have with your heads of department, because it's such a striking element in the way that it reflects these very themes that we're discussing. Um, uh, I'm working with my sister Tanya Hausner as a costume designer on all my films. And I have to say, the more we work together, the more we also develop a certain visual style together. And the cinematographer, Martin Schlacht, he's also one important player in this creating of the visuals. And it is normally my sister Tanya, who in the beginning of the preparation of the film, she comes up with different images she collected from art books, from magazines, whatever she finds. And I remember for little Joe, she had a, the picture of, a, it was from a Vogue magazine and it showed a model with red short hair and the pink blouse and the trench coat. She looked a little bit 1970s like, but you could tell that it's nowadays. And we immediately liked the image. And what I think what we like about our um, visual style or why we do it is that we try to create a world that is not easily, like you cannot say it's here and then. So the place and the time are open for interpretation. And so we liked that sort of style mix. And in the film, you will see that the style of the clothes the, the, the characters are wearing, sometimes it looks a little bit like 1960s, 70s, 80s, or nowadays, because now we do repeat all those styles. And this is interesting for us to, to create a world of its own with its own rules, but they are sort of similar to what we know. Um, I'm, I've been asked if I could just mention that that question was from Adam Morling via YouTube. So it might be that you know him, I'm not sure. Um, I've got a question for Kerry. This is from Jen. Um, she loves it when you cry on cue. How do you do it? And if you did retakes, do you have to do it again and again and again and again, given that it's Jessica doing the direction? <laughs> um, it's a complicated question about crying as an actor. Um, the thing is that the most important thing is I always try not to cry. But that doesn't always happen. And so, therefore, then you cry. And I don't know. I don't know. It's just simply what is acting. What do, what is that? You know. I imagine what I do when I'm acting is I imagine if I was this person in this situation, how would I behave? It's like it's not brain surgery. <laughs> it's pretty straightforward <laughs> you know it's something I've done all my life it's not it's not something I it's best if I don't think about, about it so. um Emily is that something that you oh Emily you still on you might need to oh, oh yeah unmute yourself oh okay um <clears throat> just yeah it's just that same question about um about emotion and that thing when you um hold the uh, uh what's how you're playing under under the surface just knowing when the camera's right there in front of you that you just how mm -hmm. internalized you feel you have to be particularly actually with your character because she's very um she's having so much it feels like she's having so much internal dialogue with herself mm -hmm. yes well jessica helped with that i mean i guess our discussions help with what decisions i made because it's very much jessica's style and you can't really second guess that. So I guess my, my job was probably different to Carrie's in that I had to, I guess, Alice's journey was, uh, you know, went, went through all sorts of twists and turns and unexpected things. So yeah, mostly I think Alice was fairly paranoid and she's quite a cerebral person, I guess. Um, also quite sensible. 
but then also anxious. So, yeah. Well, I'm afraid that that is um that was our last question, and we are out of time. Um, so I want to thank BFI Distribution for making tonight's event possible, but most of all, pleased to thank our guests Jessica Hausner, Emily Beecham, and Kerry Fox. Thank Little Joe is available now to stream on Curzon Home Cinema. So if you enjoy the film and this event, please do tell people. Just a little bit more about the upcoming events on Curzon Home Cinema. From this Wednesday, the 24th of June, it's the beginning of the Edinburgh International Film Festival, which is full of exclusive film previews and Q and A's. There'll be a masterclass from the Darden Brothers this Saturday. And then on Monday, the 29th, July, Maxine Peake, Charles Dance and director Thomas Clay will be in conversation about their latest collaboration, Fanny Lie Delivered. Sorry, that's June or July. And then on Thursday, the 2nd of July, the director Stéphane de Moustier will be in the Curzon Living Room to talk about his new courtroom drama, The Girl with a Bracelet. You can follow Curzon Cinemas on Twitter and Facebook for all the latest updates. I've been your host tonight, Hannah Patterson. Please thank you uh, for joining us and hope to see you again soon. Good night. <laughs>